All right, uh, so this is cross-domain transfer in humans and machines, okay? And it's joint work uh, with Andrea Martin and Guillermo Puebla and John Hummel. So um, uh, let me see if I can do this. How do I do this? Okay, cool. no, that doesn't work. Uh, all right. Oh, there we go. Cool. Um, so uh, uh, it's 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 probably pretty well known that um, current uh, hot hot machine learning algorithms like deep neural networks are doing a great job at um, radically outperforming humans on all kinds of tasks. They're better at playing any individual game than a human with enough training. They're better at maybe doing any individual task than a human with enough training. But unlike humans, they're not so good um, as generalists. Uh, why that this is why am I failing? Okay, why? Uh, so, so one one question you could ask is why? And uh, my, my 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 colleagues and I, along with some other people, have basically um, put that down to how uh, deep neural networks and humans uh, learn to represent the world. So, what DNNs learn is um, statistical relations between inputs and outputs, be that between say game screens and particular moves. Um, and as long as inputs don't change. Uh, and the environment doesn't change, performance is going to remain top notch. So if you play the same game or have the same environment, you're going to do well. But if you change the input at all, so you play a different game or you move something a little bit on the screen than what the system's used to, performance is going to sort of fall off a cliff, right? So if you ask the system to play a different game or, or in a different environment, the, the system's not going to do so well. And you know, despite the messaging from um, lots of uh, proponents of, of deep networks who do a really good job of, say, building lots of different models and then calling them all by the same name so that they sound like they're the same model, really what, what, what they're doing is they're building a different model for every single task. right? Uh, by contrast, that's not how humans learn. Humans learn relations between states of the world. And um, what, 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 we, what we generally do, I, I think, is we um, use these relations that we learn in some domains to then solve problems in other domains. And as, as a function of this, we can do things like learn uh, some strategy in some particular environment, like a video game, and then we can apply that strategy in a different environment, like a different video game, or even something like cooking, right, or solving problems in the world. Um, why is this failing? I'm very okay. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, humans. Well, I, 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 just, I, I should I should say as you scale, right? representations have format and content. Right, the content is they have some information. They stand in an equivalent class of something in the world, but they also have a format. Right, the content's organized in some way. And what I'm sort of positing here is the format of human mental representations is very different from the format of the representations that deep neural networks learn. So humans learn mental representations that are structured, that is symbolic and relational. Uh, they encode relative, not ab only absolute information. And um, deep neural networks just at present don't don't do that. Right. Um, so I don't think I need to uh, wax poetic about how nice relations are in this particular crowd. Um, in fact, I've cut all those slides from, from this talk. Um, but, you know, I, every, everyone, I guess, in this audience is going to accept that, uh, or most people, I guess, in this audience are going to accept that um, having relational or predicate-based representations are, are going to do a lot for your thinking. They're going to allow you to sort of uh, behave qualitatively differently than a system that couldn't represent those same things. So, so you can do things like appreciate the similarity of any f of x to f of y, regardless of how similar x is to y. When you learn a relation in some context, it, it generalizes to novel arguments for free. It's probably in the limit what supports human level generalization, but the cost of it is that it's hard to learn, and, and predicates are hard to learn for a couple of reasons. One is that predicates aren't like objects. They're functionally a different data type. Um, predicates aren't, like, aren't objects. Like I said, they qualify objects. Or, for example, red X qualifies a particular property of X. It is not the same as the X itself. And as a function of that, they have to be dynamically bound to objects. The predicate has to have a way to be about a particular object at any particular time. And then if the object changes that property, the predicate has to be able to separate from that object and no longer be bound to that object. And that turns out to be um, not impossible by any stretch, but not the easiest thing to do in a distributed neural system like a brain or a neural network. Although um, lots of people over the years have proposed lots of, lots of interesting ways to, to get that done. Um, you, you have to basically add something to a neural network in all these cases to get it to, to solve this dynamic binding problem. Um, the, the, the second issue that makes predicates a little bit hard to learn is predicate representations are fundamentally different from the examples from which we learn them, right? So predicates are promiscuous and that they can apply to any objects once we learn them. So once we learn what aboveness is, we can apply it to any set of two things. But we never actually get uh, uh, such embodied, such disembodied representations of, of these predicates or relations in our experience, right? Every relation that we experience is exquisitely tied 
to particular objects. So the um, instances from which we learn these predicates, the examples we get, are fundamentally at odds with the end state representation that we have, right? Our, our end state representation doesn't care at all about the particular arguments that the relation takes, um, yet our experience with these relations uh, cares very much uh, about the objects that these relations take because they, they are never separated from these particular objects. So when you account for relational learning, there's a set of problems that you have to solve. This is probably not an exhaustive list, but one is that um, you have to be able to detect or learn to detect uh, relevant relational invariants. So if you've got a scene like this, where there's this thing and that thing, this is a table and a hammer. And yes, I did draw these myself. Um, and, and this is some uh, perceptual input that comes into the system in some neural code. You have to essentially learn that this stuff, whatever this stuff is, is what encodes things that are bigger than other things and is what's going to be active across different instances where one thing is bigger than another. Uh, then we have to be able to isolate that stuff, right, and represent that as an explicit property. So we have to be able to pull this stuff out of this context in which it comes and represent it in some format explicitly. And finally, we have to represent that thing, that explicit representation, as a structure that can take arguments. We have to make it into a predicate. So this, for instance, can be bound to something like table, right? And in essence, this is a problem of learning content, like what it means to be uh, uh, inf relationally in or informatively a relation. And these are a question of learning a format, right? They're learning this information in a, in a, in a way, in a manner, in a form um, that it behaves like a structured representation of a predicate, right? So I'm gonna talk to you uh, today about a model uh, that uh, we built called Dora um, that, that solves to some extent the problem, or is at least tries to solve the problem of how we learn uh, relational representations from unstructured inputs. It's a symbolic connections model. Um, it's descended from Lisa. In fact, it uh, is, is based on the same computing principles as Lisa and takes Lisa as a special case as it, as it grows up. Um, and the, uh, like I said, it learns structured representations from unstructured inputs and the resulting representations end up doing a reasonably good job mirroring uh, the structure sensitivity and semantic richness that characterize human cognition and allow us to um, account for um, some phenomena from the uh, literature in, in cognitive psychology and, and cognitive science. So um, I, I'm gonna try talking a little bit about the basic architecture of the model. Um, so basically we've got, uh, well, the way Dora works is you've got these, uh, layers of bi-directionally connected units called tokens. So T1, T2, and T3 here, these are just layers of token units. Um, and then uh, uh, at the bottom lower, the layer of tokens, the T1 layer is connected bi-directionally to a set of features. And these are things that qualify properties of, of stuff. They might be the, the output of a perceptual system or, or, or something of the like, although probably they get modified during learning as well. Um, each of the token units, is yoked to an inhibitor. This inhibitor integrates uh, input over time and then essentially turns off its yoked token unit after it reaches some threshold. And this is uh, essentially for the purpose of, of implementing some kind of unit refraction or, or, or tiring. Um, the long-term memory of the model is this stuff. All these tokens are the long-term memory of the model. And there are essentially independent sets within long-term memory, which are differentially potentiated units which are what we take to be the system's uh, working memory, right? So you have a set that's the driver, um, that's the focus of attention in the model. So what the model is currently focusing on at any time T. And then there's also a set of potentiated units called the recipient. And this is uh, equivalent to sort of like active memory in Cowan's terms. These are units that are, are ready to be processed or sort of um, at the threshold of being processed. And importantly, these sets sort of float around. They, 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 they can move around within long-term memory. So any units can enter the driver or recipient from long-term memory by becoming potentiated. Um, importantly, once uh, with, within a set, but not outside a set, there's lateral inhibition between the units in the set, right? So when a set of units are in the driver, they laterally inhibit each other. Similarly, when a set of units are in the recipient, they laterally inhibit each other. And activation flows in the model, essentially from the driver, the thing that Dora is thinking about, the focus of attention, to the feature units, and from these feature units to the rest of long-term memory, maybe directly to the recipient, but also to the other units in long-term memory. So you have essentially this activation flow in the model that goes from these potentiated units to these features, and then to the rest of long-term memory, right? And there's also uh, excitatory mapping connections that are learned between co-active units across these 
uh, potentiated memory sets, these driver and recipient sets. So uh, in, 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 in reality, these uh, uh, mapping connections are actually instantiated as particular units that change their connections. But you can, you can think about these just as um, weights that get updated, right? So essentially when two units are, co and we'll talk about this a little more in a second, but essentially when two units are co-active across these sets, uh, the system can learn an excitatory connection between them, uh, evidencing some correspondence between them in the, course of in the, in the state of processing. Okay, so that's essentially the architectural assumptions of the model. Those are the, the, the way we assume the model works. Um, and it, it doors a little bit different, like Lisa, it's a little bit different than most neural network in, in that it's not just a, it's not like a feed forward network that has an input and an output. It's, it's, a, it's a state network or a settling network, right? Um, so you essentially run the model by implementing some start state, like shooting activation into the system. And this can be activation shot into memory. So maybe potentiating something from memory, or this can be via activating a set of features, seeing something in the environment. But essentially you, you have some start state in the model where some subset of the units are getting input. And then these units uh, start to, to compete and settle, right? So they, they compete with each other via lateral inhibition. And after a while, different units get active and the, and the model essentially settles in some stable state where it stays for a while until one of these yoked inhibitors fires or some set of them fire, which in, a, in essence creates an instability in the state, right? And then you have a new state of, settle, of settling until the state model settles again. And, and that's basically how the, how the model works. You just repeat this over and over and over again, right? Once, once uh, 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 you imp input something, it'll, it'll run until it settles and then it'll come out of settled state and then it'll run some more and then it'll come out of settled state and it'll run some more and so on and so forth. Um, now, when the system is settled, uh, it essentially learns these mapping connections that I talked about before. So um, it learns uh, uh, excitatory connections between coactive units in the same layer across the driver and the recipient. And it also engages in a sort of representation learning, um, which is uh, essentially what it, what it does it, in, in, gross, in gross terms it, is it activates nodes in layers of the network where none are active based on current mappings. And then it updates uh, connections between nodes in all layers uh, based on simple heavy and learning, right? So just you co-active, you, 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 the weight goes up, you're decoactive, the weight goes down. Um, so one of the main points in the sort of Lisa E's Dora framework is a constraint uh, that the, the actual representational format that we assume puts on the problems of learning. Um, so essentially we constrain the problem of learning relations uh, via the particular representational system that we posit that the system uses, right? So it, traditionally in most symbolic models, you use something akin to a propositional notational um, format where so you have a, a situation like this where there's a table that's bigger than a hammer and you represent this with a predicate uh, I don't know or something equivalent like a like a node in a directed graph with, with arcs and stuff but anyway you have a a predicate like bigger than and this predicate is a singular entity that then uh, takes some arguments via binding right and in this particular case bigger than takes table and hammer as arguments and table by virtue of being listed first is basically plays the agent role of bigger than it's the bigger thing and hammer by uh, by virtue of being listed second plays the patient role it's the it's the smaller thing right now, another way to represent this exact same information is something called a role binding calculus. It's just a different uh, formalism for representing this stuff. And a role binding calculus is essentially a, a take on a monadic calculus in the sense of the predicates in the system are all single place, but there's a linking operator. There's an additional operator in the system that allows you to stick together sets of single place predicates to form what's equivalent to a multi-place relational structure. So instead of representing this situation as the predicate bigger than table hammer, you represent the bigger role bound to table and the smaller role bound to hammer. And then you link these together in some way to say that this bigger than state is with close with this smaller than state. So this makes an entire relational structure where you've got a table that's bigger than a hammer, right? And this is nice for a number of reasons, but at least as it relates to uh, learning representations, it's nice because it reduces the problem of learning representations that we talked about being a little bit difficult to solve, or learning relations, excuse me, uh, uh, that we talked about being a little bit difficult, difficult to solve earlier into two actually much simpler problems, which is instead of learning whole relations, all you got to do is learn single place predicates, right, or representations of object properties. And then once you have sets of these, you have to link, uh, 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 well, constituent sets of these single place predicates together to form multi-place relational representations. So you have to link the right ones together. There's op absolutely problems you have to solve within this domain. But, but I think these two problems are a lot simpler than the original problem that we had of how do you learn a relation, right? You, you, now we're saying, oh, how do you learn a single place predicate? And then how do you stick uh, meaningful sets of these together, right? And this is essentially the problem that Dora solves. So I'm going to talk a little bit today. This is a sort of a roadmap of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Dora's starting state and then sort of a functional overview of how it does a set of the 
routines that are important for the remainder that representation learning stuff that we're talking about, which are essentially mapping single place predicate learning and then learning uh, multi place relational representations. Um, and I'm going to talk uh, a little bit also about how, and this is the, again, the pr problem of format learning. How do, you, how do you learn representations of a particular format? I'm going to talk also a little bit about how you might learn uh, relational content. This is um, some novel stuff we've been, or re reasonably recent, I guess it's four years old at this point, but some reasonably recent stuff we've been adding to the model. Um, so Here's Dora in a nutshell, right? So we're gonna come back to this summary later on, but hopefully this is somewhat useful. Um, there's an algorithm that's gonna extract systematic invariants from flat feature vector representations, and it's gonna to learn to represent those invariants in a form that basically behaves like a single place predicate. That's a format issue. Uh, it's gonna lick, link, 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 lick, that, that's much, okay. It's gonna link uh, systematically co-occurring single place predicates together to form structures that are gonna function after the link together, like multi-place relational propositions. That's another format issue. And then um, it's also going to learn uh, implicit invariance of relative or relational features that emerge as a function of comparison. And this is going to get into the relational content learning issue. Right? OK, so here's the DORA network. right? You've got your long-term memory with your token units, and you've got your feature units. And the way that DORA starts is that there are individuated objects, each connected to a set of features that, that encode that object in a distributed fashion. So here's, say, the hammer from before and all the stuff that's uh, encoded about the hammer, uh, perceptual properties, tactical properties, I don't know, emotional properties, whatever. And here's the table and the features that encode it. And then there's a driver, right, which are what the model is currently thinking about. So in this particular case, the model is thinking about the hammer and the table. So at this layer, the T1 to the T1 layer, you've basically got um, sets of units that are conjunctively coding sets of features to form uh, individual objects from the environment. Now, this, uh, 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 this is what you, what you start with pre-learning, and this is what you have post-learning, which is a, an entire collection of connected nodes across these layers. Um, but what you have in this layer here, this T1 layer, is not just object, but this is also where Dora is going to learn uh, single-place predicate representations. Right? Um, you have this layer right here, where Dora is essentially going to learn predicate argument conjunctions, so uh, conjunctions of a particular predicate to a particular argument. And in this layer right here, you have conjunctions of roles and fillers, and so this is the, the layer right here in this T3 layer, the door is going to learn to conjunct sets of uh, predicate argument conjunctions to form uh, multi-place conjunctions. So this is what the system's going to end up with post-learning. Um, and what these units right here are going to do, these are conjunctive units that are useful for lots of things, among them long-term storage. Uh, you don't um, uh, want to have a dynamic binding signal that that is responsible for maintaining things long term because dynamic binding takes energy and you'd prefer to reduce your amount of energy when you're just storing something. Uh, but this conjunctive coding is uh, a coding that violates role filler independence. So these conjunctive codes actually violate the independence of the elements so bound. So this particular conjunctive unit for uh, some property R let's say right of, and the hammer is uh, violating the independence of what it means to be right of and what it means to be hammer by, by sticking these together in a, in a central place. Um, so for the purposes of uh, uh, dynamic binding, you're gonna need also a signal that maintains the binding representation, or uh, not maintains, but uh, uh, carries the binding information, excuse me. Um, in these units right here, these object and predicate and feature units that actually do maintain role filler, role filler independent. So in this case, this unit here, let's say coding something like write of, and this unit right here coding something like hammer, they are independent of each other, right? This, this representation of write of, whatever these properties are, and this representation of hammer, whatever these properties are, are, are not overlapping. And in principle, this representation of write of could go with other stuff, and this representation of hammer could go with other stuff, right? All right. Uh, so let, we'll get into the binding in, in, in just a second, how that binding works. But for now, there's a set of basic operations that the model uses. And again, I'm gonna go over in uh, sort of functional terms and, and hopefully semi-illustrative and, and useful terms, how these operations work in the model. Again, this is a gross overview. If you have any uh, specific questions, um, I'm super happy to talk about them because that's the stuff I like to talk about. But again, we're at an overview level right here. Okay. So one of the basic operations in the model is um, analogical mapping. This is just adopted from Lisa. And basically functionally what, functionally what analogical mapping is, is um, uh, uh, you, you map some element representation A in the driver and some element B in the recipient together as a function of how similar A and B are to each other and how similar A is to other stuff in the recipient C that is not B. Right, so um, items are going to be mapped as a function of how similar they are to each other, and also competing similarity between other elements in the driver and recipient. So here, let's let's sort of illustrate that here for a second. So here's some units in the driver and recipient. Here's A, 
in the driver and here's B and C in the recipient. Again, it's a simplified case, but if A becomes active in the driver and activates its constituent features, what you can see is that a has more features in common with B. It has two features in common with B than it has with C. It has only one feature in common with C. So these, uh, these units are going to become active. They're going to pass activation to B and C. B and C are going to compete to become active. But by virtue of the fact that B has more in common with A, it's going to tend to win this particular competition to become active. It's going to become active. It's going to then inhibit C to inactivity. And the model can then learn a mapping connection because A and B are coactive uh, in the drive and recipient at a particular time. So that's, that's basically how mapping works. Um, based on these mappings, Dora then learns representations, right? And the basic learning uh, operations in Dora are reasonably straightforward. But um, when the model is learning in the simplest case, that is when there are only objects like A and B in the uh, driver and recipient, then Dora will learn a new representation P as a function of the mapping of those representations A to those representations B those representations A in the driver to B in the recipient. And that P is essentially going to be a single place predicate that codes for the featural intersection of A and B. So let me unpack how that works, right? So let's say you've got a representation A and B in the driver and recipient and doors map them, right? So there's this mapping connection over here. Um, when these two representations become coactive, they're both gonna pass activation down to their constituent features. These features are gonna be getting input from the A's and from the B's, right? From the, oh, sorry, not the A, the A and the B. And any features that are unique to either A or B are gonna be getting some input. And any features that are shared by A and B are going to be getting more um, in this case, twice as much input. So if units become active as a function of the input that they're getting, basically these units right here are gonna become roughly twice as active as these unshared units over here. So these red units are gonna become roughly twice as active as these pink units. Um, so Dora exploits this particular signal that emerges when two things are compared. It, it, uh, it invokes its self-supervised learning routine. Basically the self-supervised learning routine works by recruiting units based on mapping. So when there are mapping, self-supervised learning runs. It attempts to recruit units at layers uh, above where the mappings are. So in this case, it recruits uh, a, a unit in this layer over here and a unit in this layer over here. And these units learn connections to active units uh, in, in via heavy and learning, right? So this unit here is gonna learn connections to these two units over here because they're both active. So it's gonna learn connections here and here. And this uh, unit over here is gonna learn connections to active uh, feature units, right? So it's gonna learn strong connections to these units over here and then weaker connections to these units over here. So essentially what we're gonna have is this unit over here is coding for the feature overlap of A and B or the intersection of A and B. And this whole structure here is going to behave like a single place predicate. The result is basically a representation, like I said, that codes for the feature overlap of A and B. And it turns out that it's, it acts like uh, a, a, a single place predicate. I've called it F here for function um, because it's bound to B and it can be bound to other stuff. So here's how binding in a system like Dora or a neural system can work. This is one of the many ways that it works. Um, basically, it, it, when you're going to bind in a neural system, regardless of the mechanism that you're gonna use for binding, um, what's important about the dynamic binding system if you want it to be successful is it, it has to represent uh, or maintain uh, 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 binding information, or has to represent binding information while maintaining role filler independence. The binding mechanism cannot violate the uh, independence of the item so bound, right? So you've got to maintain role filler independence in these units here in your binding mechanism, right? And luckily this falls right out of a system that has lateral inhibition and layers of conjunctive units. So let's say this is the driver now. Let's say this is after Dora's learned some other stuff. It's learned this F uh, about B and it's learned this property L about T. Maybe this is that the uh, 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 ball is faster than something and this is that the T is um, lower than, so I don't know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But uh, but F about B and L about T, right? So you've got this F that's got a conjunctive code with B and this L that's got a conjunctive code with T. So this is after, after some amount of learning. Now, when these elements are in the driver together, this pattern is just going to emerge, right? So if these units start to become active, right? These, these uh, basically role binding conjunctive units start to become active, they're going to compete via lateral inhibition as a virtue of noise or priming or whatever. One of these two things is going to win, say this one wins, it's gonna force the other one into, into, in, into inactivity, right? Now, once this uh, uh, F plus B role binding is active, it's gonna pass activation down to its constituent predicate and object, right? They're gonna compete again via lateral inhibition. And one of these is then gonna win based on noise or priming or whatever, right? So let's say F becomes active, it's gonna become active, it's gonna activate its constituent features. After it uh, 
uh, its inhibitor fires, right? Its yoke inhibitor fires. B is going to become active, and that's going to that's going to stay active for a little while. Once the F plus B inhibitor fires, once this entire proposition is inhibited, that will allow the L plus T uh, proposition to become active. It will become active, pass activation down to its constituent predicate and object, right? They're going to compete, and one's going to win. So in this case, L wins, followed by the L one, right? So what you get is this uh, essentially pattern when multiple row bindings are uh, in the driver together, where you have this sequence of uh, predicate argument, predicate argument firing. So binding information is essentially carried by when particular units are firing and the roles in the fillers are kept distinct. And importantly, this particular binding signal is dynamic. If you switched around the bindings, right? If you bound F to T and L to B. So here's a, a conjunctive unit binding F to T and here's a conjunctive unit binding L to B. Again, these are the exact same F, B, L and T importantly feature units, but also um, token units right here. Um, when FT becomes active, F will become active first, followed by T. When LB becomes active, L will become active first, followed by B, right? So you've got complementary role bindings, both represented in an independence preserving, uh, in these independence preserving units. So that's, that's, that's good, okay? Now, the next part of learning is the, uh, uh, essentially the, the, the problem of uh, after you've learned single place predicates, these things over here, how do you then stick uh, sets of them together to form multi-place relations. And this essentially works as follows. Uh, when you have no active tokens in layer three, when you're representing uh, multiple row bindings, some representation E is learned as a function of the mapped elements, the mapped conjunctive row bindings across driver and recipient, right? And essentially what you learn through this process is some relational representation R, where R consists of any mapped single place predicates in one particular set, say the driver or the recipient that are linked together. Here, this bidirectional arrow is a linking operator, right? That's putting these things together to form a whole month of multi-place relation. So let's unpack that now a little bit. So let's say, this is again, after Dora's learned all kinds of stuff, it's learned something like there's a ball B and it's higher than something, right? And this representation tends to co-occur or has co-occurred with a particular instance where there's a paddle that's lower than something, right? So maybe the ball is actually the thing that's higher and the paddle is actually the thing that's lower, right? So you've got a, a higher ball and a lower patter, paddle. These, these are something Dora experiences simultaneously. And this reminds it of a previous instance, and you'll see why these are differently colored in just a second. You can ignore the color of these units for right now, where there was a, a cat that was higher than something and a table that was lower than something because the cat happened to be on the table in this particular Right, so these are just uh, uh, role bindings that have co-occurred in Dora's experience. Higher with ball and lower with paddle in this case, higher with cat and lower with table in this particular case, right? Now, if Dora attempts to map these two representations, what you'll find is that the blue units, and this is why they're colored, will map to the other blue units and the red units will map to the other re red units as a, as a function of the fact that there are these uh, shared predicates between them, right? So there's a higher in this case, so the higher and cat will map to the higher and ball, and there's a lower in this case, which means the lower and table will map to the uh, lower and paddle, right? So that's what these units are essentially uh, demonstrating. I'm gonna take these units out, and that's why I have the color there because this, this is a very busy figure, but essentially any units that are the same color are mapping to each other, right? So these two uh, T2 units are mapping to each other. These two T1 units are mapping to each other because they're not uh, italicized, these two, T1 units are mapping to each other, right? These two T units are T1 units are mapping to each other. They're both red, and these two uh, T1 units are mapping to each other, right? T1. And you just use the exact same learning algorithm that we described before, that self-supervised learning algorithm, where essentially you recruit a layer above any units uh, that are uh, mapped when none is already active. So you recruit a layer, say, here in the recipient, and then you update connections between this unit and any units in uh, uh, adjacent layers via heavy and learning, right? So when this becomes active, say, higher and ball becomes active in the driver and activates higher and cat in the recipient, this particular unit learns a connection to this role binding unit. And when lower and paddle becomes active in the driver, and activates lower and table in the recipient. Uh, this unit here, this T3 unit, learns a connection to this uh, T2 unit, this lower plus table unit, right? And as a result of it, what you essentially have is Lisa E. So you have the thing that I showed you before, but it's also just the way that Lisa represents uh, relations, right? As linked role filler sets, um, where the role filler sets or the entire proposition is uh, represented as a, 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 a a pattern of activation or a set of linked units over a, 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 a set of uh, layers um, where each layer, as you move upwards, say from features to uh, T3, encodes something, a more specific conjunction, 
right? And there's other stuff that Dora does too. These are essentially the same things that Lisa does. It does retrieval. So um, you'll retrieve some item B into the recipient as a function of how similar B is to A that happens to be in the driver, right? So you tend to ret retrieve things at the recipient that are similar to things that are in the driver. Um, you can perform schematization with the model, right? So if you map an item in the driver and the recipient, you will learn essentially a new representation of uh, uh, a new representation in long-term memory that is essentially an intersection of all the map units. So for example, if you happen to mass, my, map Chris loves Riley onto Drew loves, Drew likes Pat, right? You would, you, ah, you would learn a representation of uh, what all the mapped elements had in common or the intersection of all the mapped elements. So because loves mapped to likes, you might learn say a representation of a positive emotion. Maybe that's what loves and likes have in common. Uh, Chris and Drew have some stuff in common. Their person one, Riley and Pat have some stuff in common. Their person two, right? So you've learned a schematized representations of the, uh, representation of the items so mapped. And you can also perform generalization in the model. So if Dora maps two propositions, it'll basically generalize any unmapped information from one to the other. So again, here's a, uh, another simple example. If uh, Chris loves Riley and buys Chris flowers and that maps onto a case where Drew loves Pat. So the loves maps to loves, the Drew maps to uh, Chris and the Pat maps to Riley. Dora can use essentially copy with substitution and generalization. The same, same thing that every model of analogy uses but it uses the Lisa version of this to infer that uh, this buys stuff will also be inferred about the, uh, the, the case where Drew loves Pat and, and the model will infer that Drew might buy Pat flowers or something like that, right? All right, so that is a whirlwind tour through how content learning works, or sorry, sorry, how uh, format learning works in the model, how the model learns essentially uh, single functional single place predicates and then links sets of these single place predicates together to form uh, constituent multi-place relations. Now it's also this problem of content learning that we talked about before. And that's basically how might a system detect or learn to detect invariant properties of relations that may be defined by our properties by say, like property or maybe defined by properties like sameness and difference and relative magnitude. And it turns out that these and other relational invariants are going to emerge naturally in any system that encodes magnitude in some absolute analog proxy, either with number of units or rate code or things like that. And that's something that we know is true about uh, at least some aspects of human cognition, at least some dimensions that like things like larger magnitudes are encoded with more units uh, in say visual, visual cortex and auditory cortex and whatnot or higher rate codes, excuse me. So the basic idea is as follows. You're just gonna exploit the fact that absolute magnitudes are neurally coded by analog proxy, right? And you're, it turns out that when you compare uh, units that are encode Anal code magnitude in this analog proxy, uh, proxy this uh, 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 invariant response just falls out. This is what happens when you do this. And you're gonna use this invariant response or exploit this invariant response to bootstrap learning the invariant codes for similarity and relative magnitude. And essentially, it's just a function of vector subtraction, right? So if you have a vector A and you subtract from it a vector B and these vectors are the same length, right? But um, uh, uh, are encoding particular magnitudes such that uh, um, uh, uh, a longer vector or bigger magnitude is gonna have more units active and a smaller uh, uh, vector is gonna have less units active. So let's say A is larger than B, so it has more units active. When you subtract A from B, what you're gonna end up with is a, uh, a positive difference. And that's gonna tell you that A is bigger than B. When B is bigger than A, you're gonna end up with a negative difference from subtracting these. That's gonna tell you that B is bigger than A. And when A and B are equal to each other, you're gonna end up with a different score of zero. And that basically tells you that A and B are the same. And there's lots of, again, lots of ways to implement this in a neural system, but here's a really simple way. If you have two units that are encoding magnitudes in this analog proxy, and they are laterally inhibitive, and you activate um, any units that are at least present in one of the two options, you, 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 you clamp those, and you allow these two units to compete. What you're going to invari invariably end up with is the unit that codes for more becoming active first, followed by the unit that uh, 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 codes for less, right? So if this unit is yoked to say an inhibitor that turns it off after a while, it's gonna go off and allow the unit that codes for less to become active next, right? So um, this is just gonna happen whenever you have these kinds of units competing uh, for activity. And so the simple idea is just to exploit this invariant pattern, right? So if you uh, 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 have um, this unit 
learn connection, say, to some unit that comes on uh, early in firing uh, and then goes off. And this unit uh, responds to, 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 to some unit that goes on uh, late in firing. What you're essentially getting is an encoding of uh, the invariant pattern of being bigger than something or more than something on some dimension and the invariant pattern of being less than something. And the same thing you do with or the same basic idea works with the two things are the same, right? So if you have some unit that responds when multiple units are co-active, say in the case of same, these are going to oscillate at some low level and neither is going to inhibit the other, you've essentially got a representation of same. So importantly, these are just patterns of firing that emerge in the network, and these are just units that emerge in uh, or might respond, uh, uh, or the system might learn to, 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 to respond to, uh, uh, to exploit these particular firing patterns, right? And so the system has to do is, like all the system has to do is learn to respond to them, and, and that's pretty easy to do. There's all kinds of ways to build a little circuit that can produce these kinds of, uh, these kinds of representations. It's, it's actually quite trivial, but um, we build one simple one, it's a, it's a little three layer uh, uh, system that uses heavy learning to essentially learn to, uh, and, and then random initial encodings to essentially learn to, to produce some uh, uh, units uh, early in firing, some units late in firing, and some units when multiple units are co-active and are oscillating in and out of, out of frequency. So here's a, a summary, again, of what we've talked about. You've got these um, representations of objects that you're starting with. You add intersection discovery, and you get uh, explicit representation of object properties. Right? If you add some capacity for binding, say asynchronous binding, you get functional single place predicates. These uh, object properties become functional single place predicates. If you can detect relational invariance, you get functional single place uh, relational predicates, right? So you get relational uh, predicates. And I think I put that again. Yeah, I put that again, sorry. Uh, and then if you uh, perform some kind of mapping-based learning, then you get uh, structured representations of multi-place relations. I wrote the same thing twice. Sorry, I'm very tired. Um, yeah, so you get uh, 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 structured representations of multi-place relations. So start with objects, uh, intersection discovery, you get explicit representation of object properties, asynchronous binding, you get functional single place predicates. If those object properties are coding for some kind of relational invariance, these uh, uh, single place predicates are going to be relational. And if you have mapping based learning and can stick sets of these together, you can get uh, structured representations of multi place relations. So let's return quickly to the summary that we had before. There's an algorithm that's extracting systematic invariants from flat feature vectors, and it's learning to represent those invariants in a form that functions like a single place predicate. That's a problem of format. It's linking systematically co-occurring single place predicates to form structures uh, that function like multi-place relational propositions. That's another issue of format. And uh, the, uh, it's essentially learning implicit invariants of relational features um, as a function of comparison. That's an issue of content. And one question you could ask is, does all this work? I've, I've bored you for this long. And the answer is, to some extent, it does. There's lots of stuff that the model accounts for. Uh, but here's some recent stuff that we've been using the model to account for that I think is, is kind of fun. Right? So, so one domain um, that's usually the purview of uh, deep neural networks is, is video games. Um, they're very good at learning to play video games. But like I said, uh, what they don't do, um, everyone knows this, I guess, is that they don't transfer from playing one game to another without additional training. So we're going to check. And this is something that people do all the time. right? So people are very good at learning to play one video game and then moving to another video game and playing it reasonably well, um, especially if the two games are very similar to each other. So uh, we're going to try and get Dora to learn uh, uh, to play video games, right? And in order to do this, you have to augment the model in some sense, right? Because it has to deal with visual inputs. So we used a visual preprocessor that acts a lot like a uh, region of interest or R uh, convolutional neural networks, an RCNN. Um, but it essentially what it does is it detects edges and then it has two built-in constraints that any completed edges form a whole object and it has a bias towards cardinal references, right? So it, it, it encodes essentially the raw pixels on uh, the cardinal directions and absolute uh, uh, um, uh, pixels within a particular object frame as, as properties of those, those objects. So the features of an object are the uh, uh, raw pixels that exist in the entire enclosed edge and uh, uh, the pixels that um, encode the cross dimension and the left right cross dimension, the right uh, up, up down cross dimension of the object. And then the pixels that encode uh, the reference of this particular object to the center of this particular object to some reference point, which is either the edge of the screen or the center, it doesn't really matter. Okay. And then you uh, use the this the you you, you essentially um, let Dora use this uh, visual preprocessor to encode some game screens that it learns by just playing 250 games of say Pong where it behaves randomly. So it moves around the screen. Uh, it does very poorly because it's playing randomly. But on each uh, uh, iteration, it produces a game screen. You run those game screens through the visual preprocessor and you put those into Dora's long-term memory. And then you let it run its learning routine uh, on those representations. So it samples items from its long-term memory. It uh, attempts to retrieve other items from long-term memory. It tries to perform mapping, and then it tries to learn from that, and it stores from the result, and then it keeps going, right? 
Uh, and then you use these learned representations, assuming it learned something, you'll use these learned representations on some screens that it'll come across in the future in order to characterize those screens. So for example, if it learns a representation like above, then it might characterize the fact that in this particular screen, the ball is above the paddle. And you're gonna use tabular cue learning to learn to associate particular relational configurations which, with particular moves, right? So uh, again, uh, playing video games, we're gonna try and look at transferring from playing one game to playing another without training. And we're gonna um, compare this version of Dora that learns, uh, essentially learns to, to play the games via Q learning with a conventional DQN, which is the, uh, uh, the model from the famous uh, nature paper that DeepMind uh, did um, where they showed this neural network that learns to play all kinds of video games. Um, we're going to use the same DNN with the pre-processed inputs that we use just to make sure that it's not, or any success we get isn't a property of the particular pre-processed inputs that we use. We're going to also use a regular uh, DNN that works via supervised learning. So a DQN works via reinforcement learning, but we're going to use a DNN trained via backprop with the same pre-processed units that we do. Again, this is a further test of whether our pre-processing is doing something. And then we're also going to compare this to a graph net, which is essentially a relational net, which is something the folks at DeepMind have been on about lately. Um, so uh, uh, here's here's a model that, that plays breakout, right? Sorry. So again, uh, 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 all these models play in breakout, and 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 actually some humans who are learning to play breakout. It, it just happens to be the case that um, many of us are, are old enough that we, this this might be hard to believe, but there are uh, university age students who have never played uh, breakout or pong or any Atari game. Um, that is. Uh, makes me feel really old, but it, it's also true. Okay, so here are uh, humans, uh, basically, who have played uh, a couple hundred uh, uh, or, or learned to play a, a breakout by playing a couple hundred games. Um, here are the different networks that are uh, uh, trained to play breakout. And what, what you'll see is, uh, this isn't really surprising, the best performer is the DQN, right? That's the, the DeepMind sort of gold standard for playing these kinds of games. It, it very, it, not so quickly, it takes a couple million games, but it, it learns to play uh, breakout really well. Um, these other networks also take um, on the order of several tens of thousands, sometimes uh, uh, up, and, up into the hundreds of thousands of games, but they also learn to play the game pretty well. And then Dora, who learns in about a thousand games, but it, it also learns to play the game uh, pretty well. Now, of course, you might ask, why are these two networks so much better than humans? Well, it's because these two networks get to respond every four game screens, and they also don't do things like sneeze, right? Okay. So uh, now we're going to take these networks that have learned to play Breakout, and we're going to immediately ask them to play Pong, right? And what you see is that on the first game, uh, playing Pong, humans and Dora are pretty good. Dora happened to win this game. Uh, uh, didn't win, obviously, all games. It just happened to win this game. Um, but uh, humans and, and Dora are pretty good. They score a lot of points when they play Pong. However, these deep networks that have learned to play Breakout exquisitely well um, don't do so well. And even if you have it play several hundred games uh, or have these systems play several hundred games, you'll see that you know people are, are pretty good at, at playing Pong after learning to play Breakout. Dora, again, is also pretty good at playing Pong after learning to play Breakout. And these networks are pretty hopeless. So what about if you then train these deep neural networks, these neural networks that, that didn't do so well at playing uh, uh, Pong to, to, to play Pong and then go back to playing Breakout. So you train these networks until they're uh, playing Pong really well and then you go back to playing Breakout. And what you see is again, humans return to playing Breakout with no problem, Dora returns to playing Breakout with no problem, but these networks have a lot of trouble returning to play Breakout. So they, this isn't again, surprising based on things like catastrophic interference. And there's lots of, um, interesting techniques that have been proposed in the deep learning community for um, sort of overcoming things like catastrophic interference. But one of the one of the really, I think, important points there is that all of these uh, techniques have in common the fact that they require interleave training. So uh, if you don't want catastrophic interference, you have to continue to play breakout while you're learning to play Pong. And that's just not what people do, right? So people will oftentimes fi fixate on a particular thing, do it for a while, then return to the old thing. It's not like they lose the capacity to do the old thing. The next uh, simulation that we ran is we let um, uh, Dora essentially learn representations of relations not from uh, breakout screens that it was going to then play with, but from uh, images from a, the Clever data set, which is just a data set that has uh, uh, 2D images or pictures of uh, uh, shapes, 3D shapes on a background, on a black background, on a, uh, sorry, a blank background. So basically just objects arranged on a background. So we used um, the first 300 uh, uh, images from the Clever data set. We put those into Dora's long-term memory and we allowed it to learn representations uh, from those uh, 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 those images. And then we used those representations for the Q learning section when Dora played uh, a game like Breakout. 
And here is uh, the performance of Dora uh, using Clever um, on learning breakout. It learns breakout pretty well. Uh, it generalizes to Pong just like before pretty well, and it returns to plain breakout just like before. So this is a, a further cross-domain uh, transfer issue, right, where the model is actually learning its representations of a completely different domain and then using those representations to learn to behave in a second domain and then generalizing those representations to a third domain. Uh, so that's that's sort of cool. It's also true that the resulting representations uh, immediately transfer also to a number of other tasks that meet the hallmarks of sort of relational thinking. So you can take the representations that Dora learns from plain breakout or from uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, interaction with the with the clever uh, screens, and the resulting representations will do things like support app, mapping objects with absolutely no feature similarity or mapping similar but not identical predicates. So like. Uh, higher to wider, say, uh, solving cross mappings and uh, overcoming the n area restriction, right? So you can map uh, uh, predicates of arity n onto predicates of arity n plus m, where m is. And also uh, in, in the limit universal quantification in the sense that the uh, resulting representations will also work for mapping um, objects that are composed of units that have been newly grafted onto the model. So inputs that the model really has never seen before. Um, so objects of particular dimensionalities that the, that the uh, system has never experienced. Now it's also the case, it's kind of nice that if we stop the model at various points during its learning, whether it's learning to play breakout or learning from clever or whatever, and we use this knowledge that accrues to that point, we're able to simulate a number of developmental phenomena. So there's a, a pretty famous uh, paper by uh, Nelson and Benedict from 1974, which is essentially, um, a, uh, an examination of uh, children's uh, ability to reason about magnitudes, which is what Dora is learning. And what you find is if you stop Dora early in training, like after uh, a few hundred training instances, or like it gets close, close to a thousand, but like 800, say, training instances, it behaves uh, like a four year old. You let it work a little bit more, let it say learn from another thousand and it'll behave like a five-year-old and then you let it learn from another thousand and it'll behave like a six-year-old. And So that, that's kind of cool. Um, you also get the uh, uh, outcome of, say, the relational shift. So uh, there's a super famous study by uh, Radarin and Gettner from 1998, um, where they looked at uh, children's ability basically to uh, solve a uh, mapping task where there was uh, three objects, there was a triad of objects, and you essentially had to map, uh, you, you put a sticker under one of the objects, and then you had to show, uh, or the, the, the kid had to then pick uh, the element from the other set of three objects where the sticker might be. So if you put the sticker in the middle object, the kid's job was to pick the middle object. Um, but they, were, they um, uh, manipulated the similarity of the particular object. So the sticker might be hidden under the middle object, but in the bottom case, <clears throat> middle object looked very different to the middle object in the top case and the leftmost case looked very similar to the middle object in the top case right and they used sparse and rich trials so uh, trials where the uh, um, uh, there was a lot of or a, a lot of uh, 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 similarity the rich rich featured objects so things like uh, action figures and uh, you know balls with spots. So There's ob objects that had a lot of properties to them. Uh, these were the rich trials and the sparse trials were very simple objects. So things like just a square, uh, which was colored in. And what you see is again, the same rough pattern of results. If you stop door early in training, it behaves roughly like a three and a half year old. Uh, if you behave it like a thousand uh, uh, learning trials later, it behaves roughly like a four year old. And if you stop at a thousand later, it behaves roughly like a five, five year old. So that's kind of cool. Um, so here's, I guess, the conclusions, um, uh, and then I'll mercifully let you go. Uh, we're learning structured representations that is functional predicate representations of relations from unstructured inputs. Um, that requires identifying some kind of relevant invariance, isolating that relevant invariance from context, and then representing that relevant re relevant invariance as a new data type, basically something that quantif qualifies or uh, qualify that can be bound to arguments. Uh, learning structured representations then supports cross-domain tra uh, transfer of both representations and policies. So the representations that Dora learned in these, represent in these uh, simulations not only allowed it to perform different tasks, but also the policies that it learned based on these representations translated across tasks, right? So it could use the representations that it learned uh, plain breakout to play uh, Pong, but it also could use the representations that it learned play breakout to solve analogy tasks or to uh, be a participant in Nelson and Benedict or Raderman and Gettner study. Um, and then the policies that it learned doing something like playing breakout could generalize also to a new situation like playing, uh, playing Pong. Uh, 
And uh, it turns out that a model that performs this cross-domain generalization just as, as, as a matter of interest also meets similar hallmarks to child and adult cognition. And I think that's kind of cool if we're actually trying to um, not just understand or not just build a system that does the things that people do, but does uh, build a system that does the things that people do, hopefully for the reasons that people are doing them. Um, and then I'd also like to, again, draw your interest to this potential uh, point that I think is, is, is reasonably cool of cross-domain transfer being a, a, an interesting test case for discriminating uh, human from non-human uh, cognition, uh, maybe human from machine cognition, maybe also human from animal cognition, I don't know. But uh, I think at least for the difference between humans and uh, uh, traditional machine learning approaches, I think cross-domain transfer is a very useful test case for discriminating between the cognition of those two elements. So thanks to uh, those those collaborators that work directly on this project and the people um, from, from my lab and other collaborators who've worked with me on all kinds of other stuff. Thank you.